Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another installment of the CEO Flash Forum. And we are very privileged today to be having this conversation courtesy of the Gibbs Center for Business Ethics under the leadership of the executive director of the center, uh, Rabbi Gideon Pochrant. But today, the focus is me in conversation with somebody really special, uh, the CEO of KPMG South Africa, uh, Mr. Ignatius Sehule. Ignatius has a very long illustrious relationship and uh, um, career in the accounting profession. Prior to KPMG, he was also CEO at Saika. And of course, Saika is really involved in looking after the professional development of, the, of accountants, ensuring their ethical leadership as, as an industry. So it's really intriguing that uh, Ignatius then so fit to join KPMG South Africa at its lowest moment. And, and I think it's really important that we reflect on um, KPMG at its lowest moment and reflect on what enabled and encouraged Ignatius to join this organization. And so that Ignatius then shares with us the journey that KPMG has traveled to date. Um, in preparation for this session, we obviously advertised the program on various social media platforms, including uh, Facebook um, and, and and it's really interesting when you advertise because you invite uh, people to engage with you in an uncontrolled manner, in a free and authentic manner. And Gibbs came under a lot of attack for giving KPMG a platform um, to engage. And I will invite us to have that conversation. And KPMG in other quarters is continues to be seen in a very negative light. And so we are in this really privileged position of considering what that might mean to be seen in this very negative light. In the, in the case of KPMG, certainly it seems to be more persistent. In some quarters, in the case of Gibbs, we're being asked to reflect on what is wrong with us? Why do we want to engage with KPMG? So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome Ignatius. And Ignatius, uh, as you say hi to everyone, Help me to understand how you feel about those that continue to question uh, the intent and to question the journey that you are on as a team at KPMG. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be on this platform. And let me also uh, pass my greetings to uh, everyone on the platform. Um, it is uh, a very uh, difficult time that KPMG went through and that, uh, as you point out, in some quarters continue uh, to go through. Um, you know, KPMG, uh, there's been many account accounting scandals, as we know, uh, in the world, but one, of, one that is probably unique in where KPMG was involved was that it was seen to have been part of or an enabler of state capture. And that is something that is very emotive to some South Africans and, and, and that makes people very emotional and very angry. Um, and some people believe that uh, KPMG should have been allowed to shut down and, and, and disappear. Now, uh, you know, that, that view I know is held in, in, in some quarters. But if I can just go back, if you remember Enron, Anderson disappeared. Uh, did that satisfy everybody? I don't know, maybe those that wanted to see disappear had. The reality is the scars of what happened in that particular case persist till today. 
For me, it would have been better if Anderson survived and became the icon and the guardians of public interest, because then there would be benefit to the public. By the same token, uh, it might have satisfied some people for KPMG to disappear. But what we and the leadership and everybody at KPMG are doing is to try and learn from what we've gone through and make sure that KPMG becomes that audit firm that the public is happy to engage with, is happy to know that they're doing business because as you may know, um, Dr. Mtombeni, our ambition at KPMG is to be the most trusted and trustworthy professional services firm. Now we're doing everything in our power to bring that ambition to life. Now let's say five, 10 years down the line, that ambition is achieved in KPMG. Then the public would then have a firm that they can trust and a firm that they find trustworthy and a firm that serves public interest. And for me, that is important. That's what is needed. So I understand that. I, I think I, I, though, that's a view from a, a KPMG looking out perspective. Um, I'm more interested in maybe you reflecting on a KPMG listening to the outside perspective. So in other words, um, while it's great that KPMG aspires to be trusted and to be trustworthy and acting in the public interest, um, do, you re do you understand why there is still this anger directed at KPMG? And if you do, do you still have, do you have empathy for that anger? And, and if you do have empathy, what do you plan to do to address that anger, if anything at all? You know, as, as a South African, uh, Dr. Mtombeni, up to so far, we've heard about state capture, we've heard about uh, the Zondo Commission has been going, we've heard different uh, testimonies. I'm talking now as a South African, not as a, not as a KPMG CEO. South African, I have yet to see anybody pay for any of what has happened. And that remains an open wound in us as citizens of this country. And therefore, I have every empathy to people that are angry to not only KPMG, to any party that has played any role whatsoever in the state capture saga, because we haven't seen any of the players in whatever shape or form, in my view, um, anything happening in the interest of, of, of the public to up to this day. Yes, we know some, there's some, some uh, legal cases that have started here and there, whatever, but we haven't seen the outcome of any of that. So as South African, we still very, our wounds are still very raw. And I, I'm, I, I suppose until such time, we see something happen to the players, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for us to accept any kind of reconciliation that's coming from any of the players. And hence, from where I am, I have every sympathy when I look at all of this uh, as a South African. Then coming to your second part, what are we doing as KPMG if we understand that empathy? It is the reason why we've worked very 
closely and continue to do so with the Hawks in terms of assisting them with all of the information that we have to ensure that they have the, 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 the cases that they're busy with where we have the information we provided and we work with them to uh, hopefully have successful prosecution of the players that were involved in, in, in this thing. And in the meantime, yes, we continue to try and rebuild the firm to be what we would be proud of as South Africans, but we also continue on the, on the other hand to strengthen in the way that we can uh, for the cases that are before the court to be expedited and hopefully come to a conclusion that we all are looking for. So then what I'm taking out of that are two words. One is accountability and the other is trust. So what I'm hearing you talking about is you are being accountable to state institutions like the Hawks to help them to hold those that have wronged society to be held accountable. Definitely. So that, that's what Definitely. I'm hearing you say that. And uh, the other one then is uh, maybe you could share uh, the progress because when we listen to the CEO of EOH, for example, uh, he's going all out talking about how former management really let the EOH community down, they let the country down to the, such an extent that they're not even going after the CEO or former CEO of, KP, of, of EOH to be held accountable directly. Now, are you in a position today to share examples of accountabilities that KPMG has progressed to hold specific individuals accountable for their actions? Yeah, um, let me talk about that which is in the public domain because it is, it is easier to do that without breaching any confidentialities. But we all are aware of the VBS case. We all have probably, all of us have read the, the Judge Motau report. And we are all aware that as we speak, uh, I think there were seven people arrested and uh, charged, and I think there was a subsequent five more added to, to that number. And in that number, uh, it's included the former partners of KPMG that were on that audit. And that's where we come in to ensure that we assist and work with the authorities for the accountability part of it to happen. So yes, we are doing those kind of things to ensure that the actors in the play are held to account. So on that then, um, one of the questions on the q and is really helps us to bridge from the accountability to the trust element, which is that an audit firm relies significantly on the perceptions of trust in the public eye. KPMG has broken this trust in South Africa. What is KPMG doing differently to rebuild trust? Has it held its bad employees accountable? We've spoken about that. Has any action been taken? You have, you have spoken about that. Let's talk a lot more about the words that in a previous session you and I had, uh, you spoke about two words, which I'd be interested for you to build on the words of trust and trustworthiness. How are you practically embedding these words into the culture of the KPMG under your leadership and the KPMG that you want to bequeath to future leadership? Dr. Mdombeni from the students that we try and recruit to the students that have already signed up with us to our the people that are doing a traineeship with us and every employee including every partner at kpmg those that are with kpmg understand that to be at kpmg you're making a lifestyle choice and we share this even with the students at varsity to say, 
Don't find yourself accidentally with KPMG if you are not aligned with what KPMG stands for. Because we believe and we tell everybody who cares to listen. And we do so because we are keen to be held accountable. We're not doing this behind closed doors. That when you stay at KPMG, when you join KPMG, you are making a lifestyle choice. You, we expect you to be held accountable to our ambition of being the most trusted and trustworthy 24 seven. We're not saying you need to be most trusted and trusted when you are in and trustworthy when you are in the office or when you are in the client. We expect of each and every one of us to live like that in all of our lives, professional, social, political, otherwise, every aspect of that. Because whether we want to or not, as a KPMG person, wherever you go, you represent KPMG. Because people see you, whether at a supermarket or wherever you might be, behaving in the manner that you might be as representing KPMG. KPMG as a firm can never be trusted or trustworthy on its own. It's each individual, us as KPMG people that have in our own right to be most trusted and trustworthy for that to be seen as a KPMG ethos. So we do extensive sessions with everybody. We, we've appointed an ethics officer that runs workshops with everybody, including from myself, Abda. Uh, we, we have values that we ensure that we measure, even in our performance score, we measure the values whether as individual we are living the values of KPMG. That's more important than how much portfolio you have in rents and terms, uh, rents and cents, or what prestigious clients you have. What is important is do you exemplify and live our values in your day-to-day -day life? And for those that are not aware, our values at KPMG are integrity, excellence, courage, together for better. That's what we stand for. And that's what we'd like people to look at us and measure us against that which we say we are on our day-to-day -day interaction, including in our social life. And that's key, social life, because we believe somebody that's not trustworthy in their private life, it's only a matter of time that that untrustworthy person will show up in the office or at the client. Whenever I talk to the students and I say to them, Guys, you must understand, when you cheat your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your spouse, there's no place for you at KPMG. They laugh at me, I said, it's actually serious. Because you might look at it in isolation, oh no, he's cheating his boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, and you laugh it off. No, that is the character that the person is. And it's only a matter of time that the cheating person will come and cheat in, okay. your office, in the office, in the client, somewhere else. I hear you. Allow me to represent the skeptics amongst us in society and ask yeah. this question. Are you saying this is the new culture and this culture did not exist at KPMG before? I will try and attempt, and I'm saying to attempt to answer because I was not in KPMG before. But as you talk to people, you will hear people making uh, indications like, ah, oh, yeah, but we would have, we used to have somebody who's senior having an affair with somebody who's junior that was reporting to them. Now, that cannot be the right culture. You, you might think that's got nothing to do with social. It, it is not. How do you then objectively and fairly assess the performance of somebody that you are romantically involved with. You have to have bias. You don't have a choice in it. And therefore, that cannot be okay. But also, you need to have an environment that says somebody like the ex-partner of KPMG who did the VBS uh, audit should not be feeling comfortable and raising, rising, uh, 
up the ladder in an environment that says people of your caliber are not welcome. It should be such that people that do not buy into the value system, people that do not buy into that ambition, feel uncomfortable amongst us. Such should be the strength of the culture that they shouldn't feel that they can be comfortable and prosper. They need to feel that they do not belong. And it is a culture that we are building that would attract the likes of people that believe in what we do, but will equally push away people that don't share in the value system that we have. And if we don't succeed there, then we haven't succeeded in building the culture that we want. People that do not buy into our values system, people that buy into our, our, our ambition, should not feel at home at KPMG. We talk Thank about that. Um, and they need to feel that they don't belong. So I think you answered uh, the question that has been raised by Vera Tavares, who says, how do you ensure that your employees are in fact living your values? You're saying, make it feel uncomfortable. But now one of the questions that I think uh, you spoke about is not just about your portfolio. Help us to understand, because Anonymous is saying, ultimately the intention of any enterprise is profits. And some of the strategies in your firm may hinder profits, which may further affect the operations. So in other words, how do you balance values and profits? Or do you think, see them in, as competing? How do you see this new culture that you are talking about resulting in a profitable organization? Uh, Anonymous, I don't think what you asking uh, on how do we balance uh, is the thing that we uh, should worry about. Because you balance if you think they are competing issues. But in my view, you look after the values. You look at the quality. You must ensure that whatever assignment you put out there is of an unquestionable quality. You go back to our value, of excellence, you, you ensure that the culture is right. I believe if you do all those things, the governance should be right, the culture should be right, the quality should be right. The till will look after itself. If you do all the right things, you will do business with the right lines, you will charge the appropriate fees for the excellent work that you do that your client will know you for and therefore will not have a grudge in paying for the excellent service that you have. And you will be working with clients that have similar values to you. And the till, that is my philosophy, the till will look after itself. You need to put pressure on everyone to have the right values. Believe you me, it goes out there in the marketplace and people want to work with honest people. People want to work with people that deliver quality. People want to work with people that look after communities. Gone are days where the cowboys are the ones that are popular in town that go and uh, discharge uh, chemicals into rivers that poison people. Gone are the people don't want to do business with those people. And the more the good make themselves heard, the more we will overcome this morass that we have seen sweep our country, in particular during the state, uh, state capture days. It's up to you and I, each and every individual in our lives, to ensure that we live and treat other people the way we would like to be, that we build the societies that we'd like to belong to. Nobody's gonna do it for us. And it starts here in business, in every business. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on a question uh, and, and then whilst you're reflecting on it, I want to answer one or two comments raised here by Mantati Makumbila. But so the question I want to ask you to reflect on as we move forward is 
one of the things you've done recently is talk about the role of consulting and auditing and how you believe from a KPMG perspective, clients that you do auditing for, you should not be consulting. And clients that you do consulting for, you should not be auditing, all right? And, and so this reflects, so to speak, something that also came out of the 2000s. So when people talk about Enron, they forget when this is, we're talking about 21 years ago, right? Something that happened 21 years ago when Anderson uh, uh, eventually collapsed. Um, um, uh, many of the auditing firms for a while went down the route that you are now going down. But a few years later, they reversed it. We know, for example, some of your peers like PwC and, um, and Deloitte and EY globally make more money out of consulting than they do out of audit. Um, and, and so I want you to reflect on that. And so while you're reflecting on that, Mantati, let me then share this with you. Anderson and Accenture actually divorced a year, a little over a year before 2000, so before the Enron debacle, and then for reasons other than the Enron debacle, and then the company known today as Accenture was the consulting arm of Anderson. So your, your assertion is not factually correct. Anderson did not rebrand as Accenture. That is not reflected by history. So I think hopefully that helps to answer your question. Um, and then I, I, I think later I will refer Mantati to your question around how KPMG is dealing with employees that lost their jobs. But before we go there, let me hand over back to you, Ignatius, and ask you to please share with us your thoughts on your consulting and non, -con and non and auditing separation. Um, Dr. Mtombeni, there's always been this disquiet, this dissatisfaction from the public saying, you guys, you auditing a company, on the other hand, you've been consulting and this consulting is impeding your independence that you need to be an objective auditor. And the profession and the regulators came up with all sorts of um, rules to say, okay, maybe you shouldn't do this, maybe you can do that and not this, and there are rules around that. And the audit committees, in particular, the audit committees of uh, clients listed on the JSE have moved to strengthen their control over non-audit services that the auditor can perform. And averagely, they are as generous as saying you could do up to 30% uh, of your audit fee out of consulting and they are some strict, as strict as saying you cannot do more than 10%. Uh, With all of that, there continues to be a very heightened dissatisfaction from the public about the audit firms continuing to offer consulting services to their audit clients. And therefore, as a firm, we discussed this and debated it and we felt we need to be listening more to what the voice of reason in the public interest says and defending less. And therefore, we then decided in line, if we keep saying we are a firm that serves public interest, there's many things that we need to work through. And this one was one of the easy ones from where we stand in that we could implement. Going back to the anonymous, uh, the question that anonymous raised of balancing values and, and, and profitability. We knew such a decision, not only will it cost us money immediately, but it will continue to cost us money long-term. But the important thing is, do we think this is the right thing to do? Do we think this serves the, in, in, the public interest? 
You bet we do. And that's why we did it. It was not a question of, okay, guys, but how much are we going to lose? And how does that? No, 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 no. You need to follow your principle first. And then you can see the implementation and see how do you then manage the fallout that comes out of that. And that's why we took that decision. There are very defined rules in the profession that says how you can navigate that. But we decided in the spirit of really saving public interest, this we should do. For an example, let me tell you, yesterday, I was having a meeting with a CEO of a company whose audit pitch we lost, we didn't win. And I had a meeting with him to say, can you help us understand where we came short? And one of the reasons he said is, listen, we're not such a big company. Yes, we are listed. But we're not such a big company. We would like a one-stop shop. We would like you not only to do the audit, but also to do our consulting. And when I asked your guys, they said to me, no, that's not possible because our po policy would preclude us. And I said, they were right. They were telling you the truth. And this is not about business that we lost some time in the past that we got. Yesterday, that was the reason given, one of the reasons they, the CEO gave me why we didn't get that business. So we knew these things would happen, but we took a principal position that even with that, it's not that we didn't know that some people would not want to work with us because we're not consulting. Some people would want to work with us exactly because we're not consulting, but not everyone. And it is the principal issue of what you stand for as opposed to what's gonna be in the till. Because you can't run a business like that. If you run a business about what's in the till and ignore the principle, alas, you're not going to last. That's our view at KPMG. And Ignatius, I don't want people to think that I'm giving you a soft interview and we're pally pally here. So again, I'm going to represent the skeptics and say, Maranier, Ignatius, that sounds like it was a very clever strategy because you were losing business left, right, and center. So you had to come up with a great play to stop the bleeding. How do you respond to those skeptics? This is how I respond to. If you look uh, last year, the number of new assignments that we won, from our point of view, it's really hard on me. And it was very pleasing to see that we actually making progress. Because we won some big assignments, some medium size, some small, but we won a lot of assignments last year. Even as we were winning, we were doing this work in the background. Because if you remember, we came out with that assignment, with, with that announcement early this year. So it was on the back of all the wins that we were making. And those people, the wins that we were making, we were already telling them that, by the way, if you appoint us, you must know that we are working on this. There's this possibility that we're working on. So they, they, they appointed us despite knowing that this might be. But we only finished our homework in terms of systems, how to manage it and whatever, and announced this at the beginning of this year. And it wasn't because this was a strategy to try and win clients. We were already winning a lot of new assignments in 2020 already. Actually, we started winning in December 2019 and continued into 2020. And yet we made this announcement in 2021. So it is definitely not linked to us trying to get more business. So maybe then you've partly answered and able to conclude the question that has been raised by Anonymous. How's your clientele? And what's the difference from the old KPMG, given the strategies? Is the clientele more allured than before? I presume this mean is, is the clientele more uh, interested than before um, in the new KPMG proposition? Of course, they, they, our clients uh, that existing clients that have stayed with us, the new clients that we have gained 
in, in, in the last two years or so, they have said to us that they like what they hear, they like what they see, they like the direction that KPMG, that the new KPMG stands for and what we're trying to achieve. And they would, that's why they would like to be associated with us uh, going forward. By the same token, on our side, we very choose as to who we do business with. Since I joined KPMG, we have turned down four different potential clients that wanted us to come and pitch for the work. And we've said no, because when we did our risk analysis, which has also been revamped, it's all new and we've got a new risk appetite, has said to us that these are not the kind of clients that you'd like to have. On the other hand, though these were potentially new clients that we've worked away from. On the other hand, we since after the KPMG, we've got two clients that we've that were our existing clients, where in, in engaging and dealing with a client, we realized that the risk is getting out of hand. And we've actually walked away from existing clients. So, yes, we are very discerning into who we do business with. At the same time, clients are becoming very particular in who they also have as their auditors. And we hope that would have make a happy medium or a happy marriage between ourselves and our clients. So maybe that helps us then, uh, because some of the people on the chats are still interested in the ethical dimension of uh, KPMG. So one of the people says, Will I be wrong to think that KPMG is more susceptible to ethical breaches, considering that they may now have fewer clients and may want to keep them at all costs? I think just going back to what I've just said, if we had fewer clients and we were susceptible to ethical breaches, the four potential clients that had asked us to come and pitch for their business and we said no, we wouldn't have said no. We would have gone and said, well, listen, we've got fewer clients, let's go get more. So these four gives us an opportunity. And by the way, uh, 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 one of them is listed on the main Jobek uh, stock exchange. The other one is listed on all text and the other two are two large unlisted private clients. The, so they were quite sizable clients and we walked away from, we said, no. That I also told you, we also walked away from two existing clients that we already have, that were already in our budgets. And when we look, when head and assessment do that, no, no, no. This does not line up with our risk appetite. This does not line up with what we stand for. And we walked away. So let me also say on this note, if we become a, I don't know, five billion, over company, fine, we would we, we won't say no, we'd appreciate that. But that's not our goal. Our goal is not to be the biggest or win the most, or our goal is to be that firm that people can have trust in, that firm that is trustworthy to the masses. And it's in our behavior, it's in what we do and how we do it that will determine whether we succeed and become that firm. And it doesn't matter whether we stay a firm that's just a billion rand firm or a firm that is a five billion rand firm, that is not part of the ambition. The ambition is this should be a firm that South Africans should be proud of, that people should be proud to be associated with. The size is neither here nor there, is the essence of who we are that is sitting in our hearts and that we strive to achieve, not the size. So I suppose you could do that and do well as KPMG given your history, but you can't do it on your own. You're part of an ecosystem, an accounting ecosystem. And as you said earlier, uh, the industry is replete with examples of accounting failures and accounting scandals globally and in South Africa. And, and so one of the questions that Kalib 
Mufua is asking is, um, how is KPMG addressing professional ethics amongst its stakeholders, including its employees? Uh, please mention professional ethics initiatives you have put in place thus far, or you're hoping to put in place. I imagine not just within KPMG, but industry-wide, when you're talking to your colleagues at the other big firms like Deloitte and PwC and EY and uh, BDO, etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Mtombeni, we, we have an organization called SAPT, South African uh, Professional uh, Trust or Initiative or something like that. Uh, this is where all the audit firms come together to talk about what we need to do as a profession. Believe you me, there is a realization in the profession that as a profession, it's just now I'm talking for KPMG because I'm from KPMG, but believe you me, there's a realization in the broader profession that we need serious reform in the profession so that the profession should continue to be the profession that serves public interest. This is not only a realization within KPMG because KPMG has gone through what it's gone through. All of us in the profession are aware that we've lost that luster. I always say uh, people of my age, when we got into the profession, the aura of integrity around our profession was palpable. You could almost feel it, you could touch it. It's not there anymore because of all these uh, scandals that have happened. And we are acutely aware as a profession that we need to, to get it back. As, as, as you know, you mentioned in your uh, introduction, I'm very passionate about this uh, profession of mine. I've served it uh, at SICA, and that is why uh, Professor Wiseman could, when he approached me to come and join him at KPMG, it was not a difficult discussion. Because I am very clear the kind of profession that I bought into and the kind of profession that I think need to be built into this country. And that's why I joined KPMG. And we continue to work with other people in the profession and other stakeholders to come up with the reforms that need to happen in this profession in South Africa to be able to regain our public trust, not only as KPMG now, I'm talking as an audit profession in this country. So that fact is not lost among our, our colleagues in, in, in the business. The whole industry is, believe you me, it might not appear like that if you're not involved on a continuous basis with the profession, the, we are acutely aware as an industry that things need to change and we're working on that. So then let me ask you talking about your relationship with Professor Nkuthu, I'm interested to know um, when you learned, uh, uh, I don't know if you did learn, but when you learned that whilst he was recruiting you, Professor Nkuthu was having second thoughts about staying at KPMG and had considered resigning early within three months of joining KPMG uh, as chair of the board. How did that weigh on you? How did that influence you? Actually, not at all, Dr. Mtombeni, because the short answer is I didn't know. <laughs> he looked at the time that uh, uh, he, he was on the verge of, of, of resignation. But talking to him later on, it, it was because he was still man, busy managing the, the, the crisis that have came up. And then all of a sudden, VBS broke. And, and he started thinking, oh, hell, how many other VBSs are leaking out there? Am I going to be trying to manage this? And, Every month something breaks here, every month. And that's why for him to continue, he decided every single partner, every single audit file has got to be reviewed to see that how many of skeletons are still lacking in the cupboards. 
and he had an international team come here to clean through the firm and make the thoroughest of spring cleaning so that they could give him the assurance that you're not gonna be sitting here talking about VBS and then something else uh, breaks again. And that's what made him reconsider and stay after that cleanup was done to ensure that there aren't other skeletons hanging in the closet. But didn't affect me, didn't know about that, only knew after I joined. Certainly, so Anonymous is asking an interesting question on that. In addition to culture and ethics, uh, what other changes have been made to the KPMG organizational design, structures, scorecards, practices, etc. cetera. Um, for example, things like lifestyle audits, if they are there, uh, ensuring that these are aligned to the values. Yeah, um, I'll start with an example that Anonymous gives because that's exactly what we do. At KPMG, all the partners, including myself, including board members that are independent non-executives. That means those that do not work for KPMG but are board members at KPMG. We do a lifestyle audit and integrity checks for a partner, as in a partner in the firm, your spouse and your dependent children. We do that for all the partners. We do that for all the ADs, the associate directors, that the level just before, before the partner. That, those integrity checks also, by the way, includes uh, your tax compliance, your, your, your filings with SARS and all of all the, the other compliances. That in those uh, integrity checks, by the way, are not by, done by us or an arm of KPMG. And it is an independent firm that does it on all of us. And they do not report to me as the CEO or to Prof as the chairman of the board or to the board. The fi their findings are reported directly to KPMG International. They, those results go directly to global. You can imagine uh, even though having seen our board, I don't think there would be any problem about that, but it makes it easier if they find something that is not untoward uh, with me or with any board member or with prof or anybody, it's easier for them being out there to take action against whoever it is, as opposed to maybe saying, oh, these are, are close here, they're working together. So they report at KPM International, and if anything goes wrong, KPM International takes action. Actually, in that process, when it started, that was before I joined, when it actually uh, uh, started, in the process, some partners left for various reasons. Some because, not because uh, there was something untoward, but because there are spouses who don't work for KPMG. And remember, some of us are married in out of community or property. Some of us are just cohabiting. Uh, it does not matter in KPMG terms. It does not matter how that relationship is defined. But uh, your spouse could be part of the process. And some of, in some instances, the spouse said, listen, my, what I do has got nothing to do with you, it's got nothing to do with KPMG, so I'm not going to give KPMG access to my staff. And the partner had to step down and resign because with us is all or nothing. We might want to hang on to you, but if you are not able for reasons beyond your control to participate in what the firm is doing, then clearly you can be a partner. So some did not leave because they had dirt or anything, but because circumstances precluded them from participating. And if you don't participate, you can carry on as being part of the family going forward. Those are the family rules and that's just what it is. Commendable, thank you. So I'm gonna read two uh, uh, comments on the chat. Um, one is a whistle blowing one, it's a surprise to both of us. So there's a, I'm going to out the whistleblower because they out themselves. It's 
Papilele Matlaila says, I have KPMG audited report, which was manipulated. I'm willing to send to the CEO of KPMG where there was collusion of stealing the land of the poor. So uh, we welcome Papilele to reach out to the KPMG CEO. I'm sure you can find his details on the website. They're very transparent. So Papilele, good luck. And I'm sure Ignatius would welcome receiving that report. Um, and then there's a comment from Christopher Jordan, who says, based on this discussion, KPMG have addressed the core issues. The leadership have to live the company values and then make sure that any breach is dealt decisively. Um, so I think that's, uh, you certainly have convinced at least one person, Ignatius, and that is Christopher Jordan. Um, I, I'd like to then perhaps now, um, Re, uh, think about a different stakeholder group because this is where the conversation is moving to on the chat um, around, let's say, uh, suppliers and so forth, right? So one of the comments uh, on the chat is, what is KPMG doing to support partner with SME consulting companies in the business development and technical engineering space? Do you have any such programs? Well, not specifically on engineering or, or, or anything, but what we do have is a partnership that we have with small firms. And when, when you do an audit uh, these days, you need all manner of skills to just carry out an audit. Uh, let me give you just a, an example. I mean, they're not our client, but just to, to give an example. You cannot possibly audit as well without a team of engineers. You, you stand no chance, okay? You cannot audit a bank without actuaries. You cannot audit a bank without IT skills and, and, and those technology and, and digital skills that you don't necessarily find in the person that's gonna be signing the audit opinion. So we partner with small firms that provide all manner of skills that are not necessarily only audit our accounting that we need in carrying out our work. One of the things that we're continuously looking at, not only as KPMG, but as a profession, for instance, is sustainability reporting. We're looking at it more and more and more closer. And sustainability goes far just beyond your, your debits and credits. So you need different skills. So we do have a program where we partner with small firms uh, to give them development and exposure to clients that they otherwise wouldn't be able to, whether you're from accounting or auditing or whatever. So we do have a program that, uh, like that. We also recently started a broader uh, uh, program. Uh, some of you that are on the audience might know if you're members of Abasa. We've started a program with Abasa where Abasa is creating a platform of all the small black firms around the country. And we as KPMG will be working with them on all our different clients that we have, giving them access to clients that they otherwise wouldn't be able to, helping them in their skills development, helping them in their growth strategy, because then they can have their people train with us on, on all of our clients. And, and let me tell you, we are at the beginning phases of this program. And once all of the teething problems of this program um, have been resolved, we have every intention as KBMD to go out there and invite the industry, including our competitors, to come and participate here because we believe this is a program project that's bigger than uh, KPMG, that's bigger than just us be seen to be more uh, supportive to small business or be more pro transformation because if everybody gets involved then the the acceleration of skills development and growth with all of these firms that are involved becomes that much more enhanced if there are more participants than just kpmd so every opportunity we get to review what we do and come up with new ways that will give us better and bigger results. We're always open to looking at, uh, at, 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 at different 
ways of doing things and we welcome any suggestion that anyone might have. Lovely. So the last question is from the chat and then I'll have one question for myself is there's, there's a two types of questions related to your Southern Africa consolidation. So the question is, how's that going so far? Uh, and, and, and what is the general perception in the SEDEC region amidst all this new transformation? Um, and yeah, so if you can talk about KPMG Southern Africa consolidation, please. Yes, the, the, the process is, is, is way down the track. Um, uh, we probably uh, would be fully, fully consolidated in the next six months or so. Uh, but there's a lot that we already consolidated that we would want, for instance, of things like audit quality on risk management. Uh, those that are in the audit profession will know of something called uh, ISQC1 and ISQM1. Uh, that's audit speak. We already consolidated all those projects and we're working together. And we are on the next step of, on some of the parts where we are already well advanced, we've already taken a uh, next step of that part, the, the, for instance, on audit quality, consolidating in the continent as opposed to just the region. So the, the progress is way down the line and we are moving towards actually consolidating the continent uh, at the end of the day. This is just a step on the way to consolidating uh, uh, the, whole, the whole continent. Lovely. So let me just comment to Matsi Diso Molapo. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, watch the video again. It's gonna be on YouTube shortly. Um, and then you will see the answer to your question, I think at around 20 minutes, where uh, uh, Mr. Ignatius Sehule talks about uh, the efforts that uh, KPMG has taken and continues to take to hold those that were employees of KPMG uh, who were responsible for wrongdoing to be held criminally responsible. So you, that's your question relates to that. I, I believe uh, Ignatius addressed it quite well. And then Ignatius, the other comments on the chat about how they're very impressed with your responses to the questions and continue with the good work. And I'm sure KPMG will, will do well. So if I were to ask you perhaps in the last minute to reflect on your customers, what is the message that you want to give to your current and future clients about what KPMG under your leadership and under Prof. Nkuhu's leadership stands for and, and how you want to partner going forward? As a firm, we impress upon all our people that we need to be doing the right thing all the time, especially when no one is watching. Because we're not doing the right things for the person that's watching. We're doing the right things for ourselves. We want to know that when we work with you, we will bring our best game to your assignment. We will give you challenge, constructive challenge where it's necessary. We will bring skepticism to the assignments and we will work with you to ensure that together we put out there a product that we both will be very proud of, both as a client and as auditor. And it doesn't matter what the underlying assignment is. Our ethos is whatever we touch, whatever work we do, we need to be able to deliver the quality that we're all proud of. Every single person in KPMG is encouraged and reminded every time, regardless of level and regardless of role in the assignment that you do, to consider the public interest impact of you not doing your job with the best quality. You must just consider I mean, we've learned, we've had some scars. Just think what the public interest impact of you not doing your job 
in an appropriate way, what that impact would be. And once people start thinking about that, it doesn't matter whether you're just counting fixed assets. It doesn't matter whether you're doing a mundane cash and balance, uh, 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 cash and cash equivalent balances. It doesn't, doesn't matter, but just consider the public impact of you getting that wrong. And that is why every time we go out there, we ensure as a whole team that we bring our A game to an assignment and do things right and do the right things even when nobody is watching. And we talk a lot about our values and our ambition because we want our clients and potential clients alike to be able to hold up a mirror to us and say, this is what you stand, that what you say you stand for. This is what you tell us you, how you work. If you do something different, then the client is able and empowered to challenge you. And by the way, we also empower our own employees to challenge us. If Prof or myself or anybody steps out of the line and do something that's not in line with what we preach every day. Every employee's got the right. If they feel intimidated, which they shouldn't, to go straight to prof or to come to me, they are welcome to go to anybody to say, this is what I observed. Over and above that, we also have a hotline locally, but we also have an international hotline that people can talk to if we hope we're creating an environment where people won't be scared, but you must still make provision for those that for whatever reason still feel they might be victimized. And that's why we also still keep the international and the local hotline going because we need to be held accountable to what we say, each and every one of us, if building the right culture in KPMG is to have a chance of, of succession. In the public interest, I thank you, Ignatius, and I think everybody is happy for this conversation. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed. Thank you.